Let's start the economy keynote session. I'm Ipe Fujiwara, professor of economics at the Crawford School here at the Keio University. Uh, it is our great pleasure uh, to welcome Ms. Tomoko Hayashi uh, as a keynote speaker of the Japan Update 2024. Uh, Hayashi-san is the chief economist and the director general of the Economic uh, Research Bureau in the cabinet office of the government of Japan. So that is, she is the chief economist of Japan. So it's great to have a chief economist of Japan. And thanks for coming in your really, really, really busy schedule. And uh, as the chief economist of Japan, Hayashi-san gives a public briefing to the prime minister each month on the state of the uh, Japanese economy. And uh, even with her demanding day job, Hayashi-san will uh, teach a course, teach a course at the Graduate School of Public Policy in the University of Tokyo. So, by the way, the Graduate Public Policy School of the University of Tokyo and the Crawford School here have a double degree program. So you can get the two, the two degrees for one fee. So this is a good bargain. So those who are watching this video are here, please consider this opportunity. Jani, I think I did my job. Okay, so <laughs> then, uh, okay, so the, coming back to the keynote. So Japanese economy is now in a very interesting phase, in a transition phase, traditional phase, whether we're gonna continue low inflation, low interest rate uh, environment that has persisted for decades, or we were moving to more like a normalization kind of the process. Even if we are on the normalization process, it's really hard to predict what kind of the exact path the Japanese economy will take. Okay, so under this kind of the economic environment, it is our great privilege to listen to the view from the chief economist of Japan with her more than 40, about under 40 years of experience in the policy making, economic research, and about her view on the current state of the Japanese economy and the future prospect of the Japanese economy. We will surely learn quite a lot from her keynote speeches. So please join me welcoming Hayasan as a keynote speaker of the Japan Update 2024. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ipe-san, uh, for uh, your very kind uh, introduction uh, for me. Thank you. And thank you uh, very much for having me here today. I'm Director General uh, of Economic Research Bureau, uh, leading a team of 70 economists and analysts. And my primary role uh, includes, as uh, Ipe-san described, um, presenting the economic situation in Japan and overseas directly to the Prime Minister every month as Chief Economist of the government uh, at the Prime Minister's residence. Chief Economist is a really yeah, tough job and hard job. Uh, in particular, uh, recent uh, change of uh, Japanese economy. And the monthly reports I present serve as the basis uh, for macroeconomic policy making in Japan. In addition, uh, my bureau is engaged in various research projects, including the annual economic white paper. Since I joined the government, I have primarily worked uh, in uh, macroeconomic policy making and economic analysis in the cabinet office, formulating uh, the basic policy for uh, economic and fiscal management, commonly known as honebuto policy. And uh, economic stimulus package during recessions. I have also collaborated uh, with the Bank of Japan people on various occasions, uh, most notably on the 2013 uh, joint statement of the government and the BOJ, which set the 2% inflation target in Abenomics uh, for uh, exiting from chronic deflation over a decade. Today, I'll discuss the recent developments of the Japanese economy and touch upon some challenges we face. Right. So, first of all, GDP. In the second quarter of 2024, which was released last month, Japan's annualized nominal GDP surpassed 
600 trillion yen for the first time in history. Japan's nominal GDP first exceeded 100 trillion yen in 1973 and continued to increase by roughly 100 trillion yen every five years, reaching 500 trillion yen in, by, in 1992. However, the following 30 years, it remained around the 500 trillion yen level. Why? The primary reason for this stagnation in nominal GDP was the deflation that began in the late 1990s. After nominal GDP exceeded 500 trillion yen in 1992, the Japanese economy faced various challenges, including the non-performing loan problems after the burst of bubbles, the financial system crisis in 1997-1998, prolonged uh, deflation from the late 1990s, and the global financial crisis in 2008, and the Great East uh, Japan earthquake and tsunami in 2011. As a result, nominal GDP fluctuated around the 500 trillion yen level for an extended period. The turning point came with Abe Nomics in 2013. When the second Abe administration launched Abe Nomics in 2013, nominal GDP was 502 trillion yen. By 2017, it had exceeded 550 trillion yen. And in 2021, Kishida came in and as a result of Prime Minister Kishida's new capitalism initiatives and other uh, policy uh, packages, it has now surpassed 600 trillion yen for the first time in 32 years. While 600 is so important, 600 is just a number, and it is just a nominal, not real. But I believe this milestone represents a significant step toward realizing the new economic stage uh, we are striving to achieve. And 6 trillion yen was actually a target uh, which the Prime Minister uh, Abe set in 2015, and he was assassinated, and now Kishida achieved. Of course, real GDP is more important, especially in the context of the rise rising prices. Real GDP growth in the second quarter uh, in uh, 2024 turned positive, driven by domestic demand, notably private demand, private consumption, and business investment. Real consumption increased, supported by a rise in real income in Q2 this year. Wages began to rise in 2023, last year, but they grew at a rate lower than inflation until the first quarter of this year. However, this spring's wage negotiations resulted in a record high growth, which has been reflected in the wage growth of Q2. Business investment exceeded 100 trillion yen in nominal terms last year. With the latest data reaching 106 trillion yen, a new record high for the first time in 33 years. Investment has also gradually increased in real terms. Japan's inflation rate reached at 4% in January 2023 and has been around 2-3% since November last year. The BOJ ended unconventional monetary policy such as uh, QQE, quantitative and qualitative easing, and YCC 
yield curve control, and it raised its policy rate from negative territory to 0.1% in March, and then to 0.25% in July. The BOJ uh, monetary policy has been normalized. These data and fact clearly indicate that we are progressing towards a new economic stage, moving beyond the stagnation of the past three decades. What has happened to Japan? The familiar features of the Japanese economy, nearly zero inflation, zero nominal wage growth, zero interest rates, known as the three zeros or triple zeros, seem to have disappeared. What has caused this shift? Was it the COVID-19 pandemic or Russian aggression against Ukraine or something else? I will attempt to answer these questions. I will start with deflation. Deflation, defined as a sustained decline in prices, began around 1997 to 1998 during the financial crisis and at the collapse of major financial institutions. Deflation persisted, leading the government officially declare deflation uh, in the monthly economic report in the spring of 2001. Since then, the BOJ has implemented various unconventional monetary policy tools, including QE quantitative easing from 2001 and QQE from 2013, negative interest rates and YCC from 2016. However, it is only recently that we have seen continuous inflation above 2%. Inflation this time started in early 2022 due to rising energy and food prices shown at the yellow bar and the orange bar for energy and green bar for food in the chart. This cost push inflation became a trigger for change Kishida administration has turned this cost push into an opportunity to exit in deflation by driving higher wage growth and price pass through. We have now a great opportunity to shift from cost push inflation to demand pull inflation around 2% and completely overcome the chronic deflation that has plagued the Japanese economy for a long, long time. So the key is two things, driving higher wage growth and price pass through. So transmission from import price to output price. Currently, uh, we are observing a broader range of price rising and consumer prices of around 80% items out of all items in the CPI basket are now higher than they were a year before. Inflation expectations have also changed and shifted up. Inflation expected by firms, left hand chart shows, used to be stubbornly hover around 1%, but it is now around 2%. Household inflation on the right chart shows uh, household inflation uh, expectations have also changed. Last year, more than 60% of people believed inflation would exceed 5%, but now the number of these people has declined to 45%, and one third of households expect 2 to 5% inflation. Only 10% of people expect 
low inflation less than 2%, and more than 80% of people expect, expect inflation higher than 2%. Why did it happen? I believe the key factor is the effective cost price pass-through. For example, during the sharp rise in oil prices in July 2008, just before the global financial crisis, we observed higher input prices for farms, that's green line, but only a small increase in output prices Wet line. This time is different. Both input prices and output prices, green and red, have increased due to more effective price pass through. Many firms have changed their price setting behavior, supported by the government policies promoting price pass through, especially transactions between large firms, and small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs. This has facilitated higher output prices setting without squeezing profit margins for SMEs. Wage setting has also changed. In the 1980s and early 1990s, we have nominal picture. So nominal wage growth outpaced inflation, leading to positive real wage growth. That's really normal. However, since the onset of deflation, we have experienced prolonged periods of zero or negative wage growth in both nominal and real terms. In the spring of 2022 and 23, Prime Minister Kishida urged, strongly urged, business leaders to raise wages above inflation rate to support real consumption. This resulted in the highest wage growth in 30 years in 2022, and even higher growth in 2023, marking the strongest increase in 33 years. These increases have outpaced inflation, leading to positive real wage growth. Wage setting reflects various factors. In Japan's case, it is closely tied to the labor market structure. As Alfred Harshman noted, exit or voice is key in any institutional settings. In a mobile labor market, usually, workers have leave and exit companies that pay wages lower than inflation rate. Consequently, firms are compelled to raise wage above inflation. Alternatively, if labor unions are strong enough, their voice can also drive wage increase. How about Japan? In the past, one of the notable features of the Japanese labor market is dual labor market, regular workers and non-regular workers. And until recently, the labor market of regular workers has been less mobile, and due to custom of lifelong employment and labor unions have prioritized job security rather than wage increase. Moreover, the deflationary mindset of people and firms resulting from long-standing deflation led to the zero norm of price and wage growth. The younger generation in Japan has never seen significant price and wage movements. On the other hand, non-regular workers are mobile so that the ordinary market forces work, and we have observed an increase in real wage of part-time workers since last year, red line, which reflects tight labor market. Regular workers' real wage is also moving uh, very recently, 
and it is still negative growth year on year basis, but it is improving. These factors I mentioned have changed the relationship between import prices and consumer price index. In past, CPI moved along with import prices with six months time lag. This chart shows CPI and import price with six months lag moved together in past. As import prices such as oil price rise, the CPI simply goes up through gas and electricity prices directly affected. But this time is different because the broader range of prices reflected by a price pass-through and higher wage income, thus higher demand. With this continued improvement in employment and income condition, we expect a gradual recovery to persist in the coming years. Although we remain vigilant about downside risks, including uh, the, the global uh, economic uh, downside risks, including uh, Chinese economic developments. Having said that, we face a vast array of policy challenges. Let me highlight three key things. Enhancing potential growth, aging population, and mobilizing labor and capital towards sectors and farms with higher productivity. These three issues are important for future growth and mutually related. First, potential growth. Our Bureau estimates Japan's current potential growth rate to be around 0.6% much lower than other countries. The BOJ estimates a similar figure. And potential growth rates generally consist of three factors, labor, capital, and total factor productivity. And since mid-1990s, the contribution of labor input has been zero or negative due to decline in working age population what I would like to draw your attention is that the contribution of capital input significantly declined, and the TFP also gradually declined. Why? Because the business investment remained low for a long, long time, despite very low interest rate environment. After the burst of bubble, firms suffered from three excesses, namely excess of debt, excess of facilities, and excess of labor cost. Firms are, were, were uh, eager to cut three of them, cut all the cost, including necessary investment for the future, such as R&D. This cost cutting behavior of firms has led to low capital contribution and declining TFP growth. Stimulating investment and enhancing productivity are priorities for the current administration, which is strongly promoting these policy fronts. Labor shortages are expected to drive more capital investment. The BOJ's Tankan survey shows that the number of companies facing a labor shortage has significantly increased in this economic recovery phase over the past three years. The level of labor shortage in non-manufacturing sector is now comparable to the bubble period around 1990. Recently, Many firms have started to increase their investment for labor-saving machinery, robots, and software. Second, second issue is aging and demography, and really important issues in Japan. And currently, 29% of the Japanese population is over 65 years old and 
0.4% of Japanese population are over 85 years old. We have 90,000 people over 100 years old in Japan, of whom 80,000 are women. The average life expectancy of men is 81 years, but the common age of death is 88. And for women, half of the women lives uh, excuse me, a half of the women lives beyond 90 years, and the most frequent death age is 93. So Japan is super-aged society, so everyone is concerned about the increasing cost of medical care and long-term care to support the elderly, which has led to the deterioration of public finance. Having said that, I have good news. That is, Japanese elderly are hyper-healthy. <laughs> <laughs> According to the global medical study on health and disease among the elderly, uh, Japanese elderly are the healthiest in the world in terms of Japanese, in terms of disease prevalence, Japanese people at the age of 75 are equivalent to the global average of 65. Japan also has the longest healthy life expectancy in the world. Against this background, the labor participation rate of the elderly in Japan is also very high compared to other countries. This has contributed to labor force, thereby enhancing potential growth. The third challenge I would like to stress is mobilizing resources, labor mobility, and capital mobility. First, labor mobility. In recent years, we have seen a mismatch between labor supply and demand. Looking at public employment agency data of job openings and job seekers, there is a significant labor shortage in construction workers, nursing care, and drivers. On the other hand, for white color office workers, there are just 0.4 job openings per job seeker, indicating oversupply of office workers. Private employment agency data shows similar trend with substantial shortage of engineers in ID and telecommunications, while job seekers for administrative and assistant roles have few opportunities. AI is now pushing this trend further. Improving labor market efficiency and reskilling workers to move into more productive and growing sector is urgent. Although unemployment rate in Japan is lower than uh, other countries, around 40% of the unemployed have been without work more than one year. This is further evidence of inefficiency in Japan's labor market when it comes to job matching. Greater labor mobility and more efficient matching will help boost potential growth by reallocating resources to more productive sector and farms. Mobilizing asset is another critical issue. Japanese household has 2,000 trillion yen in financial assets, but 60% of these assets are in cash and deposits. During deflation, holding assets in cash and uh, deposit is fine because their real value increases as prices decline. However, the situation has changed. More efficient financial management of household assets is key, both for improving living standards and providing financial resources to rapidly growing sector. The good news is 
the recent expansion of a special scheme for encouraging household investment, known as NISA, have prompted a change in younger generation's attitude toward riskier assets. I expect this trend to continue growing. Now, let me conclude my remarks by emphasizing the significant changes in Japan's economy. We have moved from a triple zero economy characterized by nearly zero inflation, zero nominal wage growth, and zero interest rates or negative interest rates to a more normal economic environment with 2% inflation, nominal wage growth that exceeds inflation, and positive interest rates. This shift represents a return to a more typical and normal market economy with the price mechanism working. Prime Minister Kishida has promoted this change and policies that encourage price pass-through and higher wages, helping Japan take a step forward in exiting deflation and achieving sustained inflation, supported by a virtuous cycle of price and wages. Three weeks ago, Prime Minister Kishida announced that he would step down. But I believe his legacy is substantial, laying the foundation for future growth to Japan. We would like to move on to the economy panel. Please join me in thanking Hayasa for fantastic. <laughs> Let's start the economy panel. And uh, Hayasa, will, as I said, Hayasa join uh, the panel, and therefore you still have a chance to ask a question to her. And uh, we are also very fortunate to have a, uh, splendid speakers in this economy panel. We have uh, two presenters. Uh, Professor Hiroshi Ohashi at the University of Tokyo and uh, Professor Shujiro Urata at the Waseda University. And the first presenter is uh, Ohasan, and uh, Ohasan is a vice president of the University of Tokyo and a uh, professor at the Graduate School of Economics. And Ohasan is the expert on the industrial organization and a competition policy and the reci recipient of the Ishikawa Prize of the Japanese Economic Association which is awarded annually to the Japanese researchers under the age of 50 who have conducted outstanding economic research uh, with a focus on the empirical and policy-related aspects. And uh, given these backgrounds, Ohasan served as the so many important role of chief researcher at the Competition Policy Research, research Center at the Japan Fair Trade Commission and the head of research officer at the National Institute of Science and the Technology Policy at the Ministry of Education, Sports and the Technology. If I continue to mention this, I'm gonna running up over the time, so I'm gonna stop here. And uh, today, Ohasan will give us uh, his perspective on industrial policies with a focus on uh, innovation of the green technologies. So please join me welcoming uh, Ohasan. Uh, thank you very much for, the, for your kind words, Ipei-san. Um, uh, following uh, uh, Hayashi-san's very eloquent speech, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, something about economics. I'm, I'm a microeconomist, and, and Hayashi-san is macro, and totally different point of view, but I try to complement. And, and also, I'm not representing a uh, view of the government of Japan, so that I'm Part of my talk might be a little bit uh, critical, but sorry about this. And uh, before I start, you know, I, I again express my gratitude to, uh, to Shiro Naipe uh, for this invitation and also uh, welcome me as a visiting fellow uh, uh, at, the, at the Crawford School for the past few months uh, during my sabbatical uh, leave uh, here. I am sabbatical. Uh, from the uh, Department of Economics, but actually uh, the president doesn't release me the job of vice president. So I keep the vice president position, but at the same time I, I take a leave of absence. So it's kind of a weird position right now. <laughs> and, uh, and also uh, uh, this is my first time 
to uh, for my family and I visit uh, have visit uh, this university also Canberra, and we are grown uh, very fond of the city and the university. And I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, sorry, my my tablet doesn't work. Okay, and so let me. Can you switch a slide? A quick, okay. Okay, so my, my specialty is actually competition policy, but I thought that the audience here might be interesting industrial policy, and competition policy and industrial policy is kind of the both sides of the sword. So I, I thought that you know, it would be interesting to talk about this topic. And in my talk, I am going to highlight that while Japanese industrial policy, there are a lot of industrial policy you know, out there. You know, Australia has its own industrial policy, US, Europe, and so forth, and Japan is a part of it. And, and promoting uh, uh, environmental technologies, GX, and economic security, and so forth, all included in the industrial policy right now. And, and, but there are some slight nuance in, in the Japanese industrial policy in the sense that uh, we are focusing on, uh, people often talk about industrial policy is new, but at the same time, they try to grow a new area of uh, uh, industries. So, so new industrial policy has two meanings, actually. And also, at the same time, looking back the history of Japanese industrial policy, I view that you know, this is kind of a third stage. And, and kind of, you know, right now, you know, we are kind of linked to the first stage, but actually a little bit nuanced. And so I try to uh, convey my view of uh, how the, the, these old lessons actually uh, reside in the new age. So uh, industrial policy is in full swing. You know, I know that uh, Australia has a future made in Australia, and, and also uh, uh, your, uh, you, U.S. Has CHIPS Act, or, you know, IRA, and, and Europe has also green uh, innovations. China has uh, uh, manufacturing to uh, 2025, and so forth, and full swing. And there are probably two common threats uh, across this industrial policy. One is that it's centered on fostering innovation and sustainability uh, surrounding AI and net zero. And also another common thread is uh, national security to emphasize uh, uh, strategic uh, autonomy and, and the resilience. And Japan's uh, post-war growth rate, uh, we have a tendency to compare with the U.S., and I, I think this is a bad habit, but you know, I keep uh, following this tradition. Uh, we, we hope we'll compare with the U.S. This is per capita. You know, uh, Hayashi show us about nominal GDP, but this is the real one. And, and, and you know, after the war, uh, we have a quite high externally a growth rate, as, as actually Dean of Crawford School actually mentioned at the beginning. And, and this is uh, often said that, you know, the, the Ministry of MITI, you know, the, uh, at the time Ministry of Industry and International Trade, actually played a critical role. And from the economic perspective, that this kind of uh, industry policy that played by MITI, it's seen as uh, effectively addressing a market failure where the market, you know, the basically government play a role in correcting the market, you know, well functioning uh, in the sense that, the, you know, there is an involving uh, information asymmetry, you know, that is, you know, from the industry side, it's very difficult for them to allocate what they need for, for personnel and uh, resources. We have quite limited resources at the post-war period. And also, uh, the, the, there is a market, you know, quite, quite big friction that there is someone that need to, oh, <laughs> time is up. <laughs> okay. It does that sometimes. Okay. Did I, did I push the wrong button? No, no. Okay.
So per capita growth rate, uh, growth rate actually closes in 1991. So this is where, actually, you know, the, uh, this is a time that, you know, uh, you know, up until 1991, you know, we, we see a state regulation, you know, government, you know, uh, intervene and, you know, allocate resources, you know, quite functioning well. But, you know, around the time of 1991, uh, we see the time that, you know, idea of lesser fail, you know, that, that is, the, the market should better uh, function than the government actually, you know, has started taking place. And the lesser fair idea raised question that whether government could indeed outperform the, outperform the market in allocate resources and picking winners. And, and also economists actually from outside increasingly uh, uh, turned away from uh, industrial policy, fearing more competition policy. But some people even said that, you know, competition policy should be abolished because it's a policy. So people doesn't really uh, dislike uh, the word, the policy, the government step in the market, you know, the market should be, you know, the, and people stay away from the market and the market should well function. This is kind of Chicago school idea. And, and then, you know, what happened? Indeed, you know, the, uh, as uh, uh, the Hayashi san tell us, you know, the, the 1991, you know, we have liberalized the market, we have a lot of regulatory reforms, and, and, and now we see that, you know, labor market, you know, start, you know, making progress. We have kind of close to the two full, uh, uh, full uh, employment rate. And also, um, also, you know, uh, we see a CPI, you know, start picking up, and zero we, we uh, get away from the zero inflation rate. And one of the, um, however, one of the most striking shift has been the decline in population, which has brought uh, a labor market close to the full, uh, full employment, but at the same time, uh, we have uh, a totally different uh, kind of, you know, declining population is very, give us a, a slightly different uh, point of view in terms of the economic landscape, in the sense that the, you know, uh, in the CPI increase, you know, the U.S. and Europe has been talking about this is an increasing market power in the market concentrated, and there is a you know fewer oligopoly power that actually uh, playing a role. But at the same time, you know, from the Japanese point of view, we have excessive supply now, you know, because demand is declining. Given the the same capacity, we have excessive competition, even in the absence of competition policy. So, so kind of, you know, Japanese position is some, somewhat nuanced in terms of the competition policy right now. And in terms of the micro point of view, even under liberalization, a number of uh, regulatory reforms, it's not quite unclear uh, whether animal splits of the Japanese companies actually have been fully realized. Uh, we see a corporate profit in Japan is actually booming, increasing, and reaching the, uh, the highest right now, as uh, I think Hayashi san also mentioned about it. But, but actually, you know, what we also see is that the corporate profit in Japan has been channeling it through outside, abroad. So we are investing, not domestically, but actually mainly investing in foreign markets. And also, in terms of domestic, uh, Japanese companies, at, at, at least until recently, they have a lot of cost-cutting measures. You know, they, not, they, they don't really look for value-added strategy, rather, you know, they are looking for cost-cutting strategies. And, and also, in terms of allocating spending, I just put a correlation between allocating spending and the corporate profits five years down the line has been actually weakening. And, and this is also a, not a great sign for the future innovation in Japan. So while the competition is uh, very important, uh, it is, seems to be clear that recent changes like digitalization, net zero, economic security, and population uh, decline require more than just competition. Uh, they uh, need a balanced approach that integrate uh, strategic policies to guide market towards sustainability and also 
uh, equitable outcomes. Sorry, I'm. Uh, and and then you know we we kind of uh, looking at a new regime that is a kind of hybrid approach, which is we combine a state regulation, but also we keep the market competition uh, as is important. Government play a crucial role in designing well-functioning market, but at the same time, if the market cannot do, then you know government step in and help. Uh, the example of this kind of uh, approach is called uh, uh, experimental regulations or, or responsive and agile regulation, a co-regulation of force. So let me give you two examples from uh, we call GX and, and DX. And for example, digital platform you know, has been a big issue in the competition policy. And this platform is inherently uh, have kind of called network effect, which is the, in economic terms, this is increasing scale in demand side. As, as a network becomes bigger, then it becomes more efficient. So in this sense, you know, dominant player is, you know, having a dominant player is good in the sense that, you know, as the data is bigger, then they, they are more efficient. But at the same time, dominant player can exercise market power over especially those uh, parties that are less advantaged, like, like game uh, creators. Uh, we see uh, Apple and game creators that they have to pay 30% of royalty fee that is uh, on, the, on the low case, low court case. Now, uh, what happened is EU is start regulating. They are stepping to the ex-ante regulations, uh, having a, a Digital Service Act or Digital Market Act. And we see that this kind of ex-ante regulation kind of risking undermining efficiency while uh, but at the same time, you know, the, the conventional competition policy, this is ex post regulations, it actually doesn't really uh, uh, quick enough and lacks a timely effectiveness. So what we need is combining ex ante regulation and ex post regulations. Kind of we try to adopt this kind of approach. In, so what we do is we uh, kind of we, we say, this is, uh, de first, you know, we let the company to declare what they do, and then we review, you know, whether, you know, they are complying with what they said. This is kind of a COPS Paris Accord approach. And, and we adopt this approach in the net zero and industry uh, restructuring. Uh, achieving net zero requires uh, not only decarbonizing uh, energy, like you know, the, uh, introducing renewables, but as, at the same time, restructuring manufacturing process, like steel making. You know, you put a lot of coal, and in order to uh, make a net zero in the steel making process, you have to have a drastic, totally different approach. You have to remove the, you know, the blast furnace and put it place in the totally different ones. To meet that, you know, this kind of 2050 net zero target. Uh, not only the one steel makers change the plant, but at the same time, you know, those plants are connected to each other in, in, the, in the site. So we need a coordination to, to and replace the facilities at the same time. But current competition policy doesn't really allow you to do this. You know, if you coordinate in the, facility, you know, in the, in the, in the investment or, or, or or you know, exchange information about production plants, that would be you know, very close you know, to the violation of a competition law. So in a way, you know, competition policy itself doesn't really help us achieve net zeros. And we have a number of such kind of issues that competition policy itself doesn't really help us to change or transform the economies. And this is from the METI's uh, uh, website, you know, kind of explaining the whole picture of uh, what they are uh, looking for, for the new direction of industrial policy. It's hard to read and hard to understand, actually. But, <laughs> but what, I, what I wanted to say is that, you know, they seem to have eight sectors, including uh, GX and DX, and at the same uh, uh, digital and, and the greens. 
At the same time, you know, they are looking in order, in order to achieve it. They saw that they need OS, you know, kind of vehicles to to achieve, you know, to 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 make you to reach to the goal. And and they have so eight goals and and five OS, and and other, you know, it's it's very difficult to decipher anyway. But and and and. And currently, you know, the industrial policy is still, you know, just started on the third stage uh, in Japan. But this is kind of uh, a new ones. You know, the, the first stage is state regulations. And, and the second stage is competition policy. The, the pendulum swing, you know, one side to the other. And now we try to look for a middle stage where uh, state interventions and, and the competition policy combined together. This kind of idea is uh, actually in the old school, in the school, old school of uh, student of uh, Japanese policy knows about this. And Chalmer uh, Johnson has a book on Miti's, uh, Miti and, and the Japan's miracle. And he mentioned about you know, market economy with plan rationality. This is actually, I thought, that, you know, exactly what you know, the, the, our government actually tried to pursue, you know, combining these two. And to, to transform uh, the traditional you know, economic and social structure, and at the same time try to achieve uh, innovations, including uh, uh, AIs, we try to invite investment for semiconductors. Uh, TSMC and uh, Rapidus, and and also uh, GX. We we have you know tons of invest in renewables, and from that point of view, you know we have a lot of room. You know, increasing room for cor corporate with Australia. Uh, right now, you know we rely heavily on Australia in various actually, including uh, sourcing over forty percent of LNGs, and also you know coal. Also, you know, probably 60% of coal, you know, uh, is uh, we are importing, and and I visited Darwin and Ayers Rock. There are a huge land, a lot of sun, you know. We have tons of renewables, you know, here. So if you use, you know, those renewables, you know, transform into a hydrogen, you know, or or just using renewables, it's you you can do a lot of things. You know, it's, now we have a new comparative advantage of trade now. And where, where you have a lot of you know, advantage in terms of renewables and also uh, hydrogen. You have also big potential for CCS. In Darwin, I saw that uh, they have an impact as a new site. And the, Australia itself cannot fill all the CCS capacity. So you can actually import. Although you know, some people have a different opinion of this. But, but, but I think you have you know, a lot of path that you could take. And also, we Japan has a lot of you know we have been having a prob, you know constraint on the energy side, so there are lots of room for coordination. I thought to to have a mutual benefit, and so with this you know I I, I want to end this talk and and hope that you know uh, through this Japan update you know we see a lot of you know interaction more interactions with uh, policy exchanges uh, between Japan and Australia. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much for another uh, really thoughtful presentation. And uh, we're gonna have a second presenter so that um, it is again a great pleasure that we can welcome uh, uh, Professor Shujiro Urata as a speaker to the Japan Update again this year. Um, Urata-san was the former chairman of the uh, Research Institute of Economy and the Trade and the Industry, RIETI, uh, Japan's the biggest public uh, think tank on economic policy issues. And uh, Urata-san is an expert in international economics and international trade with a deep understanding on uh, uh, free trade agreements and economic partnership ag uh, uh, agreements. And uh, Ratsan also actively uh, contributes to this discussion on the Japan's law and other related topics uh, through the uh, newspapers and the uh, symposium. So Ratsan also uh, holds um, many important posts in such distinguished, in distinguished institutions such as the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and the East Asia area, so-called area, and the Japan Center for Economic Research, and the uh, 
Institute of Developing Economics. Again, if I continue this, I'm going to spend 30 minutes or something. I mean, we have a really great speakers in this economy session. And uh, today, Urata-san will give us his views on the Jap Japan's international economic policy with a focus on FTS. So please join me welcoming Urata-san. Um, uh, thank you very much, Ipe-san, for very kind and generous introduction of myself, and I'd like to thank Ipe-san and uh, uh, others uh, who are involved in this uh, Japan update, of course, Shiro-san as well, for inviting me to uh, give a talk on international uh, trade policy of Japan, and uh, particularly with a focus on uh, free trade agreements. Uh, in Japan, we call them uh, economic partnership agreements. Um, and uh, let's see, how do I, oh, can I? okay, uh, this is the, uh, the table of contents of what I'd like to talk about today. Uh, first, uh, uh, as a kind of background information, I'd like to compare international, internationalization of economies of uh, Australia and Japan uh, to give a kind of perspective on what uh, I'll be discussing and then turn to a discussion on Japan's free trade agreements, FTAs, EPAs, uh, evolution, motives, uh, impacts, uh, evaluation, and so on. And then uh, I turn to the third topic uh, briefly. This is uh, plurilateral trade agreements. And uh, one of the points that I'd like to mention is that the Japan's trade policy uh, are not just on FTAs, but also look at uh, other aspects such as plurilateral trade agreements. Uh, and finally, a very recent uh, uh, developments, the importance of, uh, increasing importance of economic security uh, has some implications on trade policy of Japan. <clears throat> okay, uh, yeah. I compare Australia and Japan uh, in terms of uh, trade to GDP ratio and uh, before I, you know, uh, drew this, uh, these lines, I wasn't quite sure how Japan compares with Australia. And as you see, uh, in early years, like the 1980s and 90s, the uh, ratio is much higher uh, for Australia than Japan, but now Japan is catching up. And one of the reasons, I think, is the uh, a topic that uh, was discussed by Hayasan or Hayasan, which is the demographic factor. Uh, declining population started in maybe 2005. Even before that, labor uh, 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 forces decline, started declining in 1990s. So it's kind of shrinking market, so to speak. Uh, that leads to the import increasing importance of exports for Japanese firms. And so again, uh, around, uh, say, 2020, uh, these ratios uh, uh, in terms of trade and GDP, uh, export imports uh, uh, for Japan uh, and uh, Australia, very comparable. <coughs> uh, here I compare uh, Australia and Japan uh, with other APEC economies. And I guess Japan and, uh, I mean, this APEC average is very much influenced by big countries such as US and China. So it's relatively low, and I guess uh, uh, APIC average is about the same as the, that for Australia and Japan. Uh, and then I look at the uh, uh, importance of foreign direct investment uh, to GDP ratio for uh, Australia and Japan. And here, again, uh, Australia has higher ratio for both uh, outward uh, FDI to GDP and inward FDI to GDP uh, uh, throughout the period. But Japan is catching up in terms of outward FDI to uh, GDP ratio. But what is very uh, uh, interesting and uh, different is that the uh, very low inward FDI to GDP ratio for Japan. And uh, this is one of the issues which has been discussed. I, I'm sure by policymakers and others, uh, in order to maybe revitalize the Japanese economy, one of the important factors is to attract FDI 
Uh, so again, uh, very low F inward FDI stock to GDP ratio is a sign of, uh, I guess, problem in Japan. <clears throat> now, uh, here again, I compare Australia and Japan versus other APEC economies in terms of uh, FDI to GDP ratio. And one notable uh, 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 phenomenon is that Japan's very low FDI stock, inward FDI stock to GDP ratio. And I'm not quite sure if this is accurate, but they say uh, Japan's ratio is very comparable to that of North Korea. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> no, uh, but uh, again, uh, that's the uh, very uh, challenging issue for Japan. And I was involved in one of the committees, I guess under the cabinet, uh, which is tried to formulate the policies to uh, uh, increase uh, Japan's inward FDI. But I mean, I'm not going to talk about this today because uh, my talk uh, mainly will be on trade policy. But uh, if you are interested, maybe I can respond to some of the questions on FDI as well. Now, uh, yeah, uh, well, I guess we saw this uh, similar diagram from Hayashi-san. Uh, this is a demographic change over time uh, in Japan. And Japan's population started to decline around 20. 10, I guess. And uh, if these projections are correct, uh, by 2070, uh, population will be about eight, uh, 87 uh, million. Uh, and the, that, that's uh, maybe about well, 25 less than what we have now. And what, uh, when I was looking for this kind of information, I found very interesting. Uh, 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 graph, which shows uh, Japan's population from a year 1800 to 20, uh, 20, uh, 21st century. And as you can see, uh, uh, I don't know, I just find this interesting, so I, that, that's, that's why I included in this. But the message, I don't know what the kind of message I should uh, bring, <laughs> but, uh, you know, huge, uh, I mean, very rapid increase a very rapid decline. Uh, it's, uh, I, I'll be interested in seeing similar graph for Australia as well. Uh, but if you have any uh, such information, I'll be happy to uh, hear that. Now, <clears throat> turning to Japan's FTA evolution. Now, Japan uh, FTA began to be formulated uh, uh, around uh, 20, well, the first one that we have is in 2002 with Singapore. And uh, Japan was one of the late comers in this uh, uh, FTA EPA race, uh, uh, along with China and South Korea. Uh, and, but since then, Japan actively established FTA, and now we have 19 FTAs, which cover about 80% uh, of uh, uh, trade, uh, overall trade. Uh, so it's uh, quite the, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, successful establishment of FTI throughout the, through the period. Uh, the one on the left shows the countries that we have FTA with, and the uh, graph on the right shows major FTAs, <clears throat> major meaning more plurilateral, regional, and as you can see, uh, CPTPP, which of course includes uh, Australia, uh, RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership in East Asia, which also includes Australia. And also we have uh, ASEAN Plus, so-called ASEAN Plus FTAs. Uh, <coughs> uh, and FTAP is something that uh, I guess uh, 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 it's an initiative which uh, has been discussed, and I understand that this year's Peru, APEC Peru, they are going to discuss uh, feasibility of free trade agreement of Asia Pacific area. <clears throat> now, um, motives. Uh, there are several motives behind Japan's FTA policies. One is, of course, to increase market access for Japanese firms uh, in terms of exports and also in terms of FDI. And, and another motive is to uh, uh, promote domestic uh, uh, reform, policy reform by opening up a Japanese uh, uh, market. Uh, but in, uh, and, and the uh, third one is to contribute to uh, establish an open rules-based 
uh, trade environment, uh, not only in uh, East Asia and Pacific, but also in the world. This is one of the motives. And also, uh, Japan was very interested in playing a very important or leadership role in uh, establishing uh, regional frameworks such as trade agreements. <clears throat> and here, uh, there was a very interesting uh, kind of competition between Japan and China uh, in trying to uh, lead the uh, discussions on RCEP. Of course, then after uh, that kind of rivalry existed, ASEAN realized that it's very, very important for them to take a leadership. <clears throat> now, uh, let's re evaluate the Japan's FTAs. Uh, first, country coverage. This also, uh, I already mentioned that about 80% uh, or 70% of Japan's trade, overall trade, is with FTA members. Uh, that compares much higher uh, than, say, China, are very comparable to Korea, uh, US, and EU. I, haven't, I couldn't find the uh, similar number for Australia. Maybe it's very high, too. <coughs> OK, and then uh, second uh, item is uh, issue coverage. FTA, of course, traditionally is a trade agreement, free trade agreements. Uh, that leads to uh, 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 elimination of tariffs and non-tariff barriers among uh, uh, FTA members, but now FTA covers much more than just a free trade. And uh, as you can see on the right, uh, TPP or CPTPP covers many uh, 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 issues such as uh, <clears throat> uh, investment, uh, services, trading services, uh, labor, uh, state-owned enterprises, and so on. So it, it, it has a very broad coverage. <clears throat> and in terms of uh, issue coverage, TPP or CPTPP has a very broad, and compared to, say, RCEP, uh, which doesn't have a, a, a chapter on labor or state-owned enterprises, of course, one of the reasons behind that is, of course, a very important uh, member of RCEP, China, uh, has very difficult difficulty uh, accepting such uh, uh, rules on, say, labor or state-owned enterprises. But having said this, uh, RCEP and TPP cover more than what WTO does. So again, uh, having or establishing uh, uh, these uh, WTO plus or so-called WTO extra uh, 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 agreements it's a very important contribution to uh, establishing a rules-based system in the world. <clears throat> now, I talked about tariff elimination. Uh, and as you can see, oh, here we have J Australia, Japan, and other CPTPP countries. And uh, this shows the commitment that they, they have made. Australia made 100% uh, elimination of tariffs uh, after some uh, grace period. But Japan is a country which committed the lowest, 95%. And that, of course, well, that, that is because of the uh, difficulty in liberalizing the agriculture sector. <clears throat> but oh, even <clears throat> uh, with this uh, somewhat limited uh, opening up of Japanese market, <clears throat> all these, uh, I mean, Japan's commitment is much more than what Japan committed to WTO. And as you can see on the writing on the left, uh, for Japan, uh, Japan committed 0% tariffs on 34.1% uh, of agriculture products. And even for manufactured product, 55.9%. Uh, so compared to these numbers, 95% commitment in tariff elimination is, a, I think, a, 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 a accomplishment. <clears throat> Here, uh, usage, how do countries use, how do firms, firms use, you know, FTAs, uh, uh, take advantage of tariff elimination. And what I computed here is the uh, percentage of uh, dutiable, dutiable imports, which are, uh, let's see, 
value of uh, imports came under FTAs to uh, dutable total import value. So we call this uh, import, I mean, uh, FTA usage ratio for uh, imports. Okay, here, uh, this is Japan's number. Uh, Japan imports from Australia, okay, uh, takes advantage of tariffs at 96%. Uh, that's what it means. So 96% uh, of dutable imports from Australia uses FTA. Uh, and so, uh, again, this is a very high ratio. Uh, and uh, so there are some numbers which are much lower than this. Uh, but even so, like, like China, for example, uh, is uh, uh, only 58.3%. But uh, this is, I mean, China and Korea are the countries which Japan didn't have any FTAs. Uh, but because of RCEP, uh, we have arranged free trade ag arrangements with China and Korea too. So it's, uh, I think, uh, uh, something that we can talk about. I mean, very important uh, contribution of uh, 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 RCEP to Japan's imports. And here, this is the uh, uh, usage ratio from uh, on Japan's exports. And uh, you, you cannot really compute this uh, uh, directly unless you have information about the usage of uh, FTAs by Japan's trading partners, say like Australia. <coughs> But so instead of getting that information, uh, we, uh, I get this information on the usage of uh, the number of issuance of certificate of origin, which you require uh, when you export uh, products uh, using FTAs. So as you can see, the number of certificate of origin being issued uh, for Japanese companies has been increasing. And particularly for the uh, most recent year, uh, RCEP, uh, uh, has a very large number here. And this is because of China and Korea. Japanese companies using FTAs in their exports to China and Korea. <clears throat> okay, uh, and I did some uh, econometric studies on the impacts of uh, Japan's FTAs on Japan's uh, trade. Of course, you'd expect, or the policymakers or uh, researchers expect the uh, FTA will contribute to expanding ex uh, Japan's exports and imports. Uh, but as you can see, we, we checked the uh, 17 FTAs, Japan's FTAs. And as for the exports, about 65, uh, two thirds of uh, uh, FTAs contributed uh, expanding exports. But the, uh, when it comes to imports, the number is much lower. But still, uh, I guess uh, there are some contributions that uh, the FTA is made in terms of expanding Japan's trade. Uh, let me quickly go to uh, plurilateral trade agreements. Here, uh, plurilateral trade agreements is an agreement which is a, like single issue agreements by many uh, participating countries. And here, one point I'd like to mention is that Japan and Australia uh, are co-chairs, along with Singapore, in discussing uh, electronic commerce, which is very important. Uh, and uh, here, uh, co uh, coordination and cooperation between Japan and Australia has contributed a lot. And this is the, one of the points which I like to really emphasize. Pre-lateral uh, trade agreement is a very important way to uh, 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 establish rules on new, new issues, such as digital trade uh, and so on. And finally, uh, economic security uh, here, Export control, of course, is the uh, trade policy which uh, influences trade uh, in uh, very sensitive, sensitive products. And Japan is a member of uh, uh, several uh, international agreements, but uh, that's uh, more like a traditional uh, conventional thing. But now we have uh, more coverage, greater coverage, uh, because of the uh, geopolitical tension, increasing geopolitical tensions, and uh, like supply chain resilience becomes very important. And for this, 
uh, of course, in the Pacific Economic Framework, IPEF, uh, 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 is a very important uh, <coughs> for uh, achieving supply chain resilience. And Japan has an agreement with other countries, such as the US, to uh, promote supply chain resilience. Uh, finally, I just want to mention that uh, uh, Japan and uh, uh, particularly Australia uh, 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 have a very much in common in uh, maintaining establishment, est establishing a uh, rules-based uh, trade system because uh, we are the countries which can uh, benefit, a lot, benefit a lot, especially when the big countries such as the US and China are violating some of the rules. So uh, Australia and Japan sh uh, need to really work together uh, to uh, keep or to uh, improve the situation. And uh, of course, uh, uh, economic security has become very important here again. I guess Australia and Japan can contribute or co cooperate. So uh, this is what I wanted to men uh, mention, and I hope uh, we can, uh, I still have 20 minutes, so I'll end, All right? Oh, no, this, this is, oh, oh. So, so this is what, uh, I, yeah, uh, I, I had this, I guess, before. Uh, final concluding remarks is just the, <clears throat> what I just said. I think Japan and Australia can contribute or cooperate in order to establish or maintain a rules based system and to uh, uh, secure our uh, economic security. Thank you very much. Okay, you know that uh, we covered almost all the important area in economics, in macro, micro, and international in this panel session. So you may have a lot of questions, but uh, before uh, uh, having uh, questions from the floors, maybe Hayasan, do you want to add something after your keynotes and also maybe after listening to the two panelists presented? Do you want to add something? There's a microphone maybe behind. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, please go ahead. It works. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, uh, I really enjoyed myself uh, in the presentation of Ohashi Sensei and Urato Sensei. And uh, can I ask a question about your uh, <laughs> presentation? Yes. So first of all, yes, industrial policy uh, presented by uh, Ohashi Sensei. Yes. Uh, we are now uh, in the new phase, and uh, uh, looking back to the uh, miracle, Japanese miracle uh, in the 1980s, and the success of METI in, the, in those days, as they are called uh, the METI, and uh, the, one of the secrets of the um, success of METI was, uh, in those days, uh, technology and new technology or uh, new products or industries which should be targeted was really clear. So pick, picking uh, winners, yes, we, we know uh, who are, who will be uh, winners because we learned a lot from the, the US experience and European experience, so it is easy to uh, pick uh, the winner. And now, uh, it's really great uncertainty about uh, who will be the uh, next winners. And uh, I agree uh, with GX, the, the discussion about uh, GX and DX. Yes, GX and DX are really uh, great uh, winners, and we must put great resources on that. And, uh, but, but, but on the other hand, uh, I have seen uh, eight areas, uh, indicated areas, which, uh, which was uh, described in the METI slide, perhaps, yeah. And uh, uh, some of them are really uh, vague. And uh, so uh, and some of them, others are a little bit, say, say is not, in, not concrete at all. And so uh, I wonder uh, if you could uh, respond uh, to this uh, situation uh, and the uh, imperfect information. Uh, and so picking uh, winners with imperfect 
information. Do, do, do you think, uh, does it work? Yeah, I'm looking forward to listening to it, and I would like to invest in that industry, but I all have some business. <laughs> well, I fully, is it working? I'm not sure is it works, should be, it should be okay. Okay, I, I fully agree that, you know, in 1960s, 70s, probably early 80s, you know, there is, you know, U.S. is something that we are targeting for. So if we follow, you know, basically, you know, what they do, you know, I, I think that's probably the, the industry policy at that time. Now, you know, there is a lot of in, imperfect, incomplete information in terms of what technology, for example, you know, we are talking about in the later days, you know, we're talking about green or, you know, decarbonized technology. You know, whether we should go for hydrogen, uh, aluminum, uh, CCS, there are lots of technologies that is available, and, but we don't know, you know, which one is go, going to be a winner. That's why, you know, I think the idea of uh, competition comes in in the sense that, you know, we have to see competition, you know, across technology. So we, we shouldn't pick one and bet all the money onto, onto this, but rather, you know, we kind of spread, you know, and just give them a seed money. And then, you know, I think we should, you know, in a way, you know, we should rely on what the private companies, you know, choosing and, and to try to support them. That's, that's probably what the, the current industry policy is doing. So competition is actually important, but at the same time, you know, it's so much uncertainty that, you know, the company doesn't, cannot step forward to invest, you know, huge, you know, big investments so that, you know, government can say something about them then that would be very helpful for them you know, to decide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hassan. Do you have any other questions? Yeah, yeah question. Yes. Uh, to Urata-sensei. Uh, yes. Inward uh, foreign direct investment in Japan. And uh, yes, the cabinet office, uh, the government have promoted inward FDI in Japan for more than 20 years, I think. And why uh, does why inward investment uh, in Japan uh, is so small, and why uh, that, does the government uh, policies for promoting this that, that doesn't work uh, very, very well? Oh, okay. Well, maybe <laughs> I had the same question maybe to you too. <laughs> 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 why you ask? I ask. <laughs> <laughs> As you said. I was involved in this uh, committee for more than maybe 20 years or so. It's uh, very high son as well. And uh, uh, well, one of the reasons they say is the, uh, well, uh, lack, let's see, the uh, declining population that doesn't give a very attractive market uh, for foreign companies to come to Japan. This kind of demographic factor is one, but of course, you know, aging society doesn't really mean that the market is small. It's, 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 uh, I mean, market for uh, aged people and healthcare and so on is increasing. So there's opportunity for firms, foreign firms to come to Japan. Uh, and some people say uh, still regulation. Uh, although there are lots of, I guess, the regulation being taken place uh, in order to attract FDI, but still uh, there are the reg uh, regulation which uh, kind of uh, restricts uh, uh, well, which lowers the interest of foreign firms to come to Japan and kind of mentality uh, uh, that uh, uh, like merger and acquisition doesn't seem to be accepted as a very important uh, company strategy uh, in Japan compared to other countries they're like hostile you know attitude toward this so uh, there are a number of, I, I think, issues. And one issue that I remember correctly is the, uh, when foreign companies send their uh, staff to Japan, uh, of course, it's not just, uh, say, uh, suppose it's a, a family, uh, male and female, and children. They, they come to Japan, right, to work in Japan. But if, uh, suppose, say, a husband gets, of course, working visa, uh, he wants his wife, or spouse to work in Japan as well because they were working in, in home countries. But getting visa for uh, a wife 
uh, is very difficult. And also education. Uh, international uh, schools are still, I mean, number is increasing, but still very limited, very expensive. So I think this kind of uh, uh, family-related issues is very, very important as well. Okay, maybe Ohasan and Urata may have some questions, but uh, you know, are, you know, maybe we covered lots of things. We have, a, we would like to have questions from the floor. And uh, Phil and Peter have, Peter have questions too. So, oh yeah. Uh, okay, so first, Phil, uh, could you? <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Hugh Mackay from the Crawford School. Uh, Amongst the many striking observations in your speech, uh, Ms. Hayashi, uh, was the point about the different price setting behaviour between SMEs uh, and larger firms inside Japan. Now, my interest here is, are you also seeing a similar change in price setting behaviour in Japanese firms operating outside Japan with their SME networks in, for example, in the ASEAN countries? And as a second point, are you also seeing a change in the pricing to market strategies of Japanese firms in the international market? And so, quick explanation for those who don't understand the jargon in the audience. Pricing to market means the exporter will sell their goods in the currency of the destination market rather than denominating it in their own currency and seeing wide fluctuations based on the exchange rate. And uh, perhaps also uh, Professor Urata will have some views on this as well. First. Thank you very much for your uh, question. And uh, yes, uh, price to market strategy of uh, firms, Japanese firms, and perhaps uh, uh, it's closely related to the uh, currency developments as well. And uh, uh, recently we have seen uh, the change of the company's behavior, in particular exporting companies like, for example, automobiles. And uh, so uh, during uh, the uh, 2010s, in particular before Abenomics, um, currency appreciation, uh, currency appreciation to uh, around uh, 80 or 75, uh, uh, yen per dollar, uh, this currency uh, appreciation pushed uh, Japanese companies uh, to invest overseas. And uh, uh, their behavior uh, changed their export strategy as well. And uh, uh, so uh, recently we have found, uh, for example, a currency depreciation doesn't uh, push export in volume at all. And uh, uh, because uh, overseas investment uh, is so large and, uh, uh, and also currency depreciation uh, is, that doesn't change the uh, behavior of the uh, Japanese companies, and in, in particular in terms of export and export pricing as well. And because uh, companies uh, concentrate on very high value added products uh, in Japan, in, in domestic market and export as well. And on the other hand, uh, relatively the ordinary goods uh, produce production uh, is uh, located in overseas. So different uh, strategy uh, about uh, different products. Uh, so exporting uh, industries and export uh, firms have completely changed, and uh, uh, that, that has great uh, impact on uh, Japanese farms' behavior and strategy. And uh, uh, we observed uh, this change of the uh, company's uh, behavior and strategy uh, in macro data recently. So, uh, just, yeah, two, two quick points. Uh, again, uh, large companies versus SMEs are, I think, very important kind of uh, ways to look at the, uh, say, pricing behavior as well, as far as I understand. Uh, for, for example, large companies, uh, I think they uh, cover or they hedge their risk by trading in U.S. dollars uh, without, you know, uh, say, U.S., Japan, yen, and so on. So that's one way they can really avoid uh, exchange rate fluctuation risks. But uh, small companies, they have difficulty doing so. 
And one, I think, a recent development is that because of yen depreciation, import prices went up, and a large companies, well, I don't know, this is a competition policy, which maybe I'd like to ask Ohai san about. You know, if the uh, large companies put all the pressure on f small firms to cover the cost, uh, then that's, that's a problem. And uh, there are some instances that I read in the newspaper such large corporations do really impose pressure on the small companies not to increase the price of inputs, although import prices went up, right? So this is a policy competition kind of issue, which I understand between small firms and large corporations. Yeah, PTM is related to IO, so if you can say something. Yeah, yeah so I know only about domestic market. But, you know, this is not, what Urasasan said is not probably competition policy at the same time SME policy. The, the Japanese government actually tried to uh, encourage small company to get, you know, what they cost. So, so in a way, you know, there is a partnership agreement that, you know, also your JFTC actually involved in this and, and try not to happen what Urasasan said. In the deflationary period, you know, that's what happened, you know, in a sense that, you know, the large companies try to put all the costs to, to the small and medium-sized companies. Now, small and medium-sized company can say something about the price with negotiation with, with the large companies. So it's kind of uh, going back to the normal uh, practice in the international uh, perspective. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Peter and how uh, do, do, do you have any? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so microphone, please. And, uh, oh, of course, okay. Uh, sorry, right, so you already, already I, I don't want to take um, Professor Drysdale's position, but I'll jump in very quickly here. Um, Urata san, I would love you to, when you discuss uh, some of the measures that need perhaps changing in Japan to uh, increase better engagement by or involvement um, in the economy by foreign families is that in addition to visas and housing and uh, student uh, um, sort of schools, etc., you add the very punitive uh, inheritance tax structure that exists for long-term um, residents uh, who aren't uh, Japanese as well. But I'll leave that um, because I'm pleased that it's been streaming in, in the hope that this comment is gone straight back to the Japanese tax agency. Um, but, Hayashi-san, I was wondering, we had a very interesting conversation last night about the impact that corporate governance change has had on the Japanese economy, especially in terms of uh, the commitment by many um, overseas investors to invest in Japan. I would love if you might be able to just give the audience some of those comments, because I think it's particularly uh, telling how that transformation is taking place. Thank you. Do you go first? Yes. Yeah, please. Thank you. And the change of the corporate governance is really an important issue. And uh, actually, um, well, uh, it is one of the central pieces uh, of Abenomics. And uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, pushed uh, this issue very much. And uh, I think um, this change of corporate governance has another uh, great impact on uh, transformation of our economy. Yeah, that's true. And uh, uh, yes, so uh, the picture of, for example, board members, uh, landscape of board members of the Japanese traditional companies have completely changed. Of course, there are some uh, be, uh, companies uh, which are uh, behind, but, but, but uh, in total, uh, the picture or landscape has already changed, and that's really helpful uh, for uh, promoting our potential economic growth. Thank you. Oh, Hassan, do you have uh, about the uh, corporate government through the lens of the competition policy? I would like to hear from your view. That's a very interesting viewpoint. Right. And, and it used to be that, you know, we, we, we call Keiretsu, that, you know, there is an implicit connection, you know, across companies. Mitsubishi has its own k Retsu, Mitsui has its own k Retsu. Now, having, a, you know, outside director's voice, you know, more reflect to the board, you know, discussions, I think we kind of, you know, uh, dissolve 
you know, those kind of K-rates relationship. Rather, you know, they're looking for more economic benefit, you know, which companies that they're going to hold shares and so forth. So in a way, you know, uh, we are released from the old kind of, you know, K-rates relationship rather moving forward to more fluid, you know, market, you know, mechanism, I think. Thank you. That, then, uh, you know. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you to the, all the panelists for uh, three excellent presentations. Uh, I, I just want to come back to the thing that Hayashi's uh, son's presentation focused on, which is uh, the growth potential and, and the role of productivity in the growth potential of the Japanese economy and, and uh, organise... Uh, bore down into that and, and, and ask a question about that, uh, which, which relates to the discussion about industrial policy and which aspects of industrial policy might contribute to lifting growth potential. Uh, but I wonder if, uh, Hayashi-san, you could tell us a little bit about, you know, what potential policy strategies the government has uh, to lift growth potential in Japan, because it's so important with the demographic of Japan being what it is to future growth. Uh. Thank you. I uh, thank you, uh, Peter. And uh, uh, f f very yeah, important question. And uh, how how do you see uh, your strategy about, about enhancing potential growth? Yes, potential growth uh, consists of labor, capital, and total factor of productivity. And uh, uh, I would like to stress the importance of capital and Productivity, and in particular, productivity. Uh, so, uh, as I has, have shown uh, before, um, the TFP is still very low, and uh, uh, TFP growth itself is very low, and productivity is uh, itself is low compared with other uh, countries. And uh, uh, well, uh, recently. Uh, it, there is a very uh, shocking news uh, to the Japanese people that was nominal GDP of Germany surpassed the Japanese nominal GDP last year. And that was really shocking news to the Japanese people uh, because the population size of Germany is just two thirds of Japan. And well, and, and uh, uh, say, uh, pop population and labor force is two thirds of uh, Japan, and their working hours is 80% of Japan. That means 80% multiplied by uh, 60%, 48% of labor input of Japan produced the same size of nominal GDP in Germany. So. Productivity itself is half of uh, Germany. That means, yes, there is a great room for improving our productivity. So, that's a, yes, bad news, but that's a good, we can change this, this news, good news. So, uh, now uh, productivity enhancement is priority. And uh, uh, well, population, and of course, uh, say enhancing higher fertility rates or something like that is re really important. But uh, productivity is a key. Thank you. I think uh, Peter's question is at the heart of this economy panel. So definitely, we should uh, hear from the industrial policy, also the FDI kind of thing. So Ohasan and Urasan, could you go ahead? One thing is. Uh, I agree that, you know, highest that, you know, we have huge potential, but, but potential in a sense that we should embrace, you know, we have to change the system a little bit in a sense, you know, uh, for example, uh, Uber, you know, in, in Japan, when you go to Tokyo, then it's hard to access to Uber. The part of the reason is probably, you know, we don't really embrace uh, AI or digital technologies. So in order to do so, we should change, uh, we should still keep change, you know, the relaxing, regulatory, pushing regulatory reform. And, and also, you know, I think that we should take advantage of a labor shortage because we don't have really have a conflict with labor and AI, 
we should embrace more about you know the, those kind of technology. And then you know I think we have a big potential in that sense. Hi. Yeah, Ratsan, please. Yes, uh, very briefly. I think uh, greater or more uh, internationalization of Japanese economy and Japanese society. I think it's very important to improve uh, productivity. Uh, the, what, the, what I'm saying is that, for example, a uh, number of foreign scholars, I think we have here many working in Japan, teaching in Japan, but still compared to maybe case in maybe Australia or the United States, very limited. So we need more inflow of, uh, say, scientists, researchers, and so on from foreign countries. So in order to do so, we have to provide very uh, well, attractive environment. And it's, I don't think we are providing such attractive environment at the university, for example. So that is very important. Another is, uh, although we are now uh, really uh, enjoying having many foreign tourists, especially from Australia and so on, again, there are short-term uh, visitors and we need more longer term uh, uh, people living in Japan and working in Japan. And for that, Japanese people themselves need to be more exposed to foreign uh, uh, culture, foreign countries and so on. When, like uh, we say, uh, as I'm getting old, uh, when we talk about uh, internationalization of Japanese people, among my friends, in the, you know, middle 70s, uh, and so they say, uh, uh, Japanese people uh, have many opportunities to go abroad, but they just enjoy going on a tour, uh, you know, short-term trip, and the number of, uh, say, graduate students studying in the United States, I think, as far as I understand, is declining. Much, much smaller in terms of numbers than the one, uh, the, the, uh, my kind of generation. So this kind of mentality, again, you know, you are looking, uh, uh, kind of mentality has to be changed, I think. Thank you, Thank you very much. And uh, okay, so the, we are five minutes behind the schedule, but uh, I'm sure that you'd like to continue this intellectually stimulating discussion rather than going to go to the coffee break immediately. So uh, <laughs> you are a great audience, I'm sure, for that. So that, please give us uh, maybe a four or five minutes, and um, I would like to correct the questions. Please raise your hand if you have a questions. Okay, so uh, how? And uh, one, two, one, two, three, four, five. So let's collect the questions first. And uh, as time permits, they try to answer to your question, but uh, you have a chance to discuss over the coffee break. So how, how could you go first? How? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. I, I'm Hal Hill from Crawford School. Thank you very much for three very interesting also, very, please, please make that presentations. Con yeah, yeah. Con concise. Okay. Sorry, yeah. Uh, very quick. Very quick. So industry policy has been mentioned a lot in these presentations. One of the most dynamic parts of industry policy currently is the EV market, electronic vehicles. China has, is now dominating that market. Japan is, of course, historically extremely important. Noticing in Southeast Asia, where Thailand has been the automotive hub, the transition in Thailand as a case study is really rapid to EVs with China. So I wonder what, how the Japanese automotive industry, historically very important, is adapting to that challenge. Thank you. Thank you. So let's collect the questions first. So the electronic vehicle thing, I don't know who will answer to the question, but uh, yeah, be ready for the, to answer the question. Yeah. My name is Kate Stevenson. I work for the public service here in Canberra, but I spent the last five years working for a public affairs consultancy in Tokyo. Um, I have a question about the internationalization of Japan's workforce. Uh, five years ago in 2019, I had the pleasure of hosting a panel with a number of LDP politicians. This was about the time that there were some legislatory changes introduced to do with work visas and uh, people coming into work in Japan. And I remember very distinctly from this panel, one of the participants asked Shiozaki Yashisa, um, the former minister for um, health and labor, what he thought about the new immigration policy. And he stopped and he said, no, it's not an immigration policy, it's a labor policy. And there was a very distinct feeling that short-term laborers were welcome, 
but longer term were less so. Five years on and post-COVID and with the current economic situation, I'm wondering if that feeling in that position has changed. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, you have a question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Richie Wong. I'm from Research School of Economics. Uh, my questions are directed to uh, Ms. Sorry, uh, Ms. Chief Economist. Uh, <laughs> Hayase, Ms. Hayase, sorry. Um, sorry. Uh, my question is about inequality in Japan. Uh, I know Japan has done a pretty good job in uh, mitigate domestic inequality, but recent year after COVID and uh, aging pop the population getting aging, uh, we see an increase in income inequalities. And a lot of things you have mentioned, uh, labor mobility, uh, uh, digitalized, uh, sorry, uh, institutionalized uh, economy and also um, uh, uh, decrease in TFP. Many of these topics are in related to inequality. And I like to ask, do you think that uh, inequality in Japan will become a challenge of Japan growing out of COVID? And how will government face these challenges? Yeah, and that. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Paul Harris. I'm interested in education cooperation between Australia and Japan and just following on from Urata Sensei's comments, um, over the last 10 or 15 years, Japanese universities and the Japanese government have made huge investments in internationalising the education system. So I guess with senior colleagues from government and universities, I just want to ask, are they working? Thank you. And I have a final question. Yeah, there. Over there. Uh, no, no, sorry, I think you, uh, sorry, I think you already asked a question, so, sorry, I think it's so that. Yeah, this is the final question, please uh, go yes, ahead. Uh, so I'm an analyst in the Department of Industry. I just want to ask a quick question about, uh, I guess, Japan's legacy in industrial policy. You guys kind of mentioned that in the past it was very clear about which industry needs to be invested in, and right now that's less so clear. I was just, um, I guess, kind of in the new wave of industrial policy, we see kind of all the countries around the world are implementing. Are there any lessons we can learn from how Japan's history of, um, industrial policy in terms of kind of what worked and what didn't work so well and how that might inform us in our kind of thinking in the new world. Thank you very much. So we have five questions, electric vehicle and perception of labor and immigration policy and inequality and education collaboration and legacy industrial policies. But uh, you have one minute, you know, so that maybe <laughs> you, don't have to, uh, you don't have to address everything, but uh, from the Hayasa, maybe if you want to say something, yeah, please. One minute, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, inequality uh, issue, yes. Um, so, uh, looking at inequality in Japan, uh, first of all, uh, you must look at uh, indicator, Gini coefficient. And the Gini coefficient uh, in Japan is uh, 0 0.34. Uh, average, OECD average is 0 0.32. So, uh, almost uh, the OECD average. So, uh, better than the United uh, States, but uh, well, uh, look, uh, higher than uh, the coefficient of Japan is higher than, uh, for example, uh, Scandinavian countries or European, uh, say Germany or uh, France. And uh, uh, well, uh, so uh, OECD average, and on the other hand, poverty rate in Japan is around 15%. And uh, uh, the problem is uh, this kind of poverty uh, is concentrated on uh, some particular family type, for example, single uh, parent. And so single parents' uh, poverty rate is around 48%. So uh, divorce is a really uh, high cost in Japan. And so uh, this kind of yeah, uh, particular uh, issue should be addressed. And actually, uh, the Japanese government is working uh, very hard uh, to uh, change this situation. And immigration, yes. Oh, we welcome a long-term immigration. And actually, uh, foreign workers uh, in Japan is now around 3% of total employees. So we welcome. Thank you. Oha-san, again, one minute. Industry policy, <laughs> industry policy is not uh, industry-specific policy anymore in the sense that you, know, it's, you, you have to oversee you know, cross industries. You know, when you're looking at you know, the, the aviation fuel, you don't, you don't really look at the oil industry, but rather you look at the chemical industries. So it's, it's kind of broad range of, you know, the, the, the network of industries is very important to, 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 to run the uh, industrial policy. 
I think. And in terms of EV, it's a difficult question. <laughs> we, we have, a, I, I don't know, Toyota screwed up or you know, I, it's, it's hard to tell, but uh, we are pushing, in the past, we are pushing in different directions. Now, you know, China is dominating, you know, ASEAN countries and also Europe too. Uh, we are looking for another innovation change. For example, batteries right now with lithium. We, we don't have a resource rich in terms of lithium, but if you're looking at the solid battery, you know, then, then you know, we have a chance to do this. So kind of we, we're looking for another change of innovation in terms of vehicles, I think. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, a few comments. On immigration policy, I think that Japan is op opening up, although it's slowly. And one difficulty or one problem with Japan is that uh, uh, over time change is just a changing, but the speed is very slow. So what we need is an international comparison, uh, you know, compared to say Australia, compared to the US, then uh, uh, the backwardness of Japan in terms of internationalization is, becomes very clear. Uh, one point about EV, I, I'm not an expert on this. I'm, one of the maybe problems for some Japanese companies like Toyota is they're making huge profits <laughs> doing hybrid, right? So, uh, that, of course, that means they have more money to maybe uh, financial resources to invest in uh, innovation and so on. But uh, at, one, uh, at this time, uh, the status quo or the or going on hybrid is giving a lot, lot of profits, and so there's an incentive to maybe keep that too. That's just my personal impression. Okay, thank you much. These are all great questions. So I hope you have a chance to talk with the panelists over the coffee break. So uh, again, please join me in thanking the panelists for the fantastic presentation. And also, thank you for all of you to be actively involved in the discussion. Thank you so much.